Uh, I want to thank everybody for your very eloquent comments. I think it was, you were all very well spoken. We greatly appreciate it. I think you were very thoughtful. Uh, I know it's very difficult um, to come up and <clears throat> speak in public. Um, some people's natural, some people's not. Uh, we greatly appreciate all the input from the community that helps us make educated decisions. Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to um, do no more public input at this point in time. We're going to open our own discussion uh, for case 22-02, uh, continu continuation uh, for the special uh, planning district application for Green's Home. So um, with that said, is there anything from the city we need to do? Um, or anybody in the city we need to add to this so where how we got to where we are today i guess uh, I, I, I think i can just re i can just recap where we are i mean is we this tra the tra i'm sorry we had the traffic study and the things of, yeah where we are with that so the traffic study was commissioned literally uh if not the next day the day after the last public hearing um that's about as fast as things happen to go um you know, in that regard, uh, it takes time. A, a traffic study can take 45 to 60 days, in my experience. And uh, they conducted the study on, uh, it's noted in the staff report, they conducted the study on a sunny April day, pleasant weather, um, it, it, and they have some, some comments back. They provided staff with comments. Uh, they do not have the full an analytics done. Uh, but, but those comments were provided in the report as bullet point items. Um, they, they noted there were some variations, some were higher, some were lower. Uh, they did include background traffic for Chimney Ridge and Blossom Hill, which resulted in approximately 50 vehicles altogether. Uh, TEC did the uh, video recordation of the traffic count on April 12th. Uh, there was no rain, mild temperatures, and uh, they state that due to the above factors, they do not expect significantly different results than those indicated in the original study, but they will continue to look at the data and complete the required analysis that we commissioned. Um, additionally, uh, I think the Planning Zone Commission asked for some clarification on the number of schools. Uh, Loveland schools uh, transportation reported that there are fewer than 10 from Turtle Creek, Valley Forge, and Pier Court in the White Court and They did not, I mean, we're generally, 95% I mean, of the units are, are attached dwelling units, but there are some single family homes that are on the streets. So the, the action required if, if you elect to proceed is 1150.102, requires you to either vote to adopt a motion recommending initiation vote to continue or vote to not vote to not recommend those are your three options so that that's kind of where we are okay. so i'd like to open up for discussion amongst ourselves in terms of what we how our feelings are what we like about the the concept plan or we dislike what our thoughts and feelings are about opinions on this so i'm brian let's start with you yeah i, I uh <clears throat> I was the, the person that asked for the third party traffic study um, at our last meeting. That was the primary comment from the majority of the, the residents that shared their concerns. I'm a resident. I don't get down uh, this way as much as some of you probably do, but obviously I'm aware that there is a traffic and congestion problem. I was surprised. Uh, well, I shouldn't say I was surprised. Um, the report came back, and it did back, uh, uh, back up their numbers. Uh, I insinuated that I thought it might have been misleading uh, that they didn't include some other uh, neighborhoods. And so I'll have to uh, apologize on that note. Uh, it seems as though that the uh, study came back and says that the numbers are the same. I guess the root question probably, and, and this is my fault for maybe not getting down to the root issue or understanding the root issue, but and maybe the traffic study when it does come back uh, will have the information in it. Um, I think it would be interesting and helpful to understand what a reasonable amount of traffic is. And 
when traffic engineers and city planners put together plans and they set forward goals, what are those normal traffic numbers? Um, just to state that it's not going to impact the number of current cars during a particular time and day, I don't know that that really solves our problem. Uh, everybody obviously knows there's a congestion and a traffic problem. So, it, you know, there's probably more cars than the capacity allows. So I just wanted to set the record straight there uh, and, and, and point out that the developer's numbers were correct and that their traffic engineer uh, was thorough in his investigation and came up with the same numbers. Uh, there was a comment that the traffic study had to come back. It, uh, we did get some preliminary feedback uh, to state that it was uh, consistent. Um, also, as you know, when this whole thing started, I wasn't very educated on the grail. I've become more educated on the grail. Uh, I'm not opposed to SPDs. I'm not opposed to making a change. Um, I do think I'd like to see the development to be a little bit more in tune with uh, maybe the history of the grail and uh, maybe more uh, inclusive of some of the, the natural uh, conditions, uh, more unique in its, in its feel and its nature. Um, those are my thoughts. How are any? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can, I can speak. So I, I think, uh, you know, I raised some questions around uh, at, the, at the March 17th meeting around some of the reasons about how we got to this point uh, from you know, bringing this land into the city and now um, having it before us for a um, SPD consideration. And so I think some of the things that I've wrestled with, uh, because this is a complex issue as, as we've seen with a lot of the different uh, dynamics. Um, so you know, I keep going back to a lot of the questions around you know, bringing a uh, you know, they, they mentioned Grailville is uh, it's 300 acres, but, but right now we're only looking at a third. Only one third of that is inside the city of Baltimore. Uh, so what, you know, you have to sort of uh, extricate that uh, from, the, from the issue there, that there's just a, a portion that we're dealing with. And it does come in as a residential low density, and that's what I was sort of wrestling with uh, at the March 17th meeting, was why do we have that as our uh, rule, is that uh, there must be some guiding principle as to why we start there. Uh, and then in this case, what I, my, my concerns are, we're going from undeveloped land to zone residential low density and essentially maxing it out uh, through the SPD process in a matter of three months of this plan coming into the city of Lowell. So I have concerns about just the, the rapid nature of a change. Uh, like that, uh, acquiring this land through annexation into the city limits and then immediately developing it to a point where uh, it is uh, uh, maxed out. I, I think the memo from Dries has a point in here that I kind of find, uh, um, I, I, I question this. I, basically, in concern number three, much of the 37 acres set aside for open space is undevelopable land. Uh, in the explanation, which is a, a reasonable explanation, the sentence pops out to me to say, our primary goal with the SPD is to maximize community open space and use these spaces to their full potential. I don't doubt that the reason to configure an SPD is to allow for you know, creative use of the lot design and, and allow for different zoning configurations within the larger project. But I don't know that that's the primary goal to maximize community open space. It seems like the primary goal of the SPD is to maximize lots, available lots and available houses. Uh, and so I don't know that that's, I think we have to look at it from our side as the, the, the primary goal from the city to have an SPD is, is in the, in the uh, code when it talks about creative uh, site planning and um, adding historical value and considering community benefits. And, and I don't know that, that this proposal really meets the true spirit of that at this point. Um, and I think we do have to uh, be held accountable, as one of our speakers said in an open forum, um, to you know the, the residents of Loveland, the city of Loveland, to our code, uh, to our uh, comprehensive master plan, 
all of which point to uh, the existing zoning as being what is desired in that uh, in that land. So, um, you know, that's just one argument for, from me, I think. Uh, there's a lot of other things that uh, make me a little uncomfortable. The, the infrastructure issues, the stormwater um, and sewage is not exactly um, uh, established as, as part of this plan. I know that that's not necessarily, that that's part of the, of the process going forward. I understand that. It would certainly make me feel more comfortable if it were more uh, spelled out the solutions to those issues. Um, and then lastly, I think there's another point in here in the memo about the, the strain on the school system. Um, that's not really my point. My point is that these homes, it says uh, 135 traditional homes and 74 patio homes. All of these homes will be phased in gradually over a four to seven year estimate. So by moving this forward, we're essentially saying let's put East Loveland under construction for the next decade and that worries me uh, in terms of uh, just the long-term repercussions relative to some of the traffic concerns of course but really just more coming to the quality of life issues that we've heard from today and again I, I love hearing from residents when we when we are faced with something that people feel passionate about especially when people are able to channel those passions into logic and sound reasoning. And some of the things that jumped out at me was, you know, it's a gem, it's expansive green space, do something brilliant. I mean, that is definitely not up to us to do something brilliant, but certainly we don't need to do something rash. And I think that the, from the time period uh, of, of the time that we annex this into the city of Loveland and um, today, um, I, I feel moving this forward would be a rash decision. Yeah, um, part of the reason land is brought in is low density is it's basically a placeholder. Yeah. You know, if you come from the interstate into Loveland, you notice where the Loveland, Loveland, Loveland signs are? The partway that you think is in the Loveland. Well, a lot of, a bit of that, um, as you come into Loveland, on that right hand side, all those shopping centers, if they came into Loveland, they would come in as residential low density. So it's basically a placeholder because what Lovin doesn't want to do is annex land and have to live with the zoning that a township that basically has no zoning would have. So that's kind of a, it is what it is. But one thing that hasn't been considered is, and I know I've listened to people outside of this, there's a real big problem with the, the patio homes. And I've got a neighbor that's two doors away from me. And two years ago, he put his 50-year-old son into a nursing home. Well, actually, he put his wife into a nursing home. He would love to sell this four-bedroom, two-and-a-half-bath, two-car garage home under some year. But he has nowhere to move to. He needs to move to And this, these patio homes or what he would like to have. He doesn't want to live in an apartment building. So the patio homes, they say, well, there's other ones in Loveland. They're not for sale. Uh, once they're onesies and twosies here and there. So we've got from the 50s, 60s, 70s residents who moved into Loveland, as I did 50 years ago. We're ready to move. But my generation has no place to go to to stay in Loveland. So this design does need a demand and a need for our senior citizens. And they live in my subdivision. They'll be able to afford these patio homes. And actually, you kind of need that. Be about the same dollars, otherwise you're paying taxes on, on the net gain. And that, that's just one of the things that I look at this is you know they're close together they're patio homes and that gets down to the question i asked at the last meeting how many homes in white pillars in that in the patio homes have children 
turned out as a penny. This is about half the number of penny homes. So, so those 74 homes will probably generate five kids in the school district. I did some back of the envelope cal calculations. That'll generate probably over a quarter million dollars in school district taxes. It'll probably cost the city, the city but the rate they pay for educating the student less than 50 grand. So the school district for these patio homes will pick up about 200,000 income against the student study. So that's kind of a double hit for that. But now we have to look at the whole thing. And uh, Mr. Which one it was? Uh, Mr. McGarry, uh, he said, he looked, quoted where a lot of cities are tearing, tearing down and maybe a 70% build out of homes and 30% cleaned up is kind of a nice balance. I'm looking at there, 37 acres, that's 34%. So they're at a number that seems to be a reasonable working number. So, and, and you know, yeah, a lot of it's valleys and ravines, but I grew up in Long Island in the 50s and the Levittown went in there and it didn't matter how deep the ravines were, how hard the mounds were. They just built corner to corner, edge to edge. So, and I think after hearing um, Loretta's comments about how the Grail is trying to preserve as much as they can and still provide funds for their members that need to have care. It's not true. Please. She's on, excuse me, she's on the board. I, I know, I've been on the board too. Just hang on one second. Okay. We respectfully listen to everybody here for two and a half, three hours, okay? I you have it. to, you. Yeah, there's, there's available development uh, areas outside of the city limits. 
200 plus homes will be built in and around the Lola area in the coming years. And it's advantageous to Wellflint to make sure they are built in a well-planned community within the city limits. I agree with that statement, but I don't necessarily think that that means we need to take action to, to move forward and, and, and capture those 200 homes right now in this uh, configuration and on this site. The problem is, under low density, somebody can and say, I'm going to build 109 homes, and it's done. They don't even come before us. They just go for the permit. Yeah, and I think that's the, that's the, that's the risk. Sounds like they asked for five proposals. Two people gave them proposals. You were one of the two. Obviously, your proposal was the best. Correct. Yeah. In the agreement that you made in the planning processes, do you have a plan for low density? I mean, you knew you were buying low density, or it was, always, was your plan always to end up here? Well. We bought with the understanding that we were going to be moving into the uh, um, the the attempting to annex into Loveland, and then we were we don't have a plan for low density. We've you know we spend a lot of time working through the numbers, and you know this sort of housing is again what people want, what the market demands. Um, but you it know, could be done in low density also. It could be done in low density, but in our opinion, that is uh, not a good plan and not a good prospect moving forward. Again, it's it's big one-acre lots that are unaffordable to most people, and it doesn't create the community that a SPD-type plan would create. And that's that's kind of what our thoughts are. I, I got one. If you were to develop a one-acre lots, would you pay the same price for the total packs of the land? I, I don't know the math off the top of my head. I would have to, to guess that we would have to kind of reconvene and reconsider things. There's, you know, there's so much, you know, to consider there that it's, you know, impossible for me to stand up and make it, you know, make so, it a thing. So the ground would get, would have to take a cut. Yeah, I, I mean, again, our, our, our belief is, you know, this property owner in the Grail has rights, and everyone else has developed around them as resident and zoned as residential medium as density and SPD, and they're the last one to the table now. So now they're kind of stuck. They're stuck with the traffic. They're stuck with, you know, everything else, and they have rights as a property owner and now as a citizen of Loveland to be allowed to develop in a manner consistent with what that zoning is. Any other questions? I appreciate it. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, you know, I appreciate the, the sensitivity that um, the Grail went through. I appreciate their, the, their um, you know, their, they have a right to sell their land. Um, and I appreciate them looking for a good use for the land, uh, or trying to find a good use for the land. I think that's, that's their right. I appreciate Loveland's citizens and, and their concerns um, with uh, the use of the land and trying to preserve it. I think we can't lose sight of the fact that there is, um, Claremont County has a large park right beside it and that's been preserved as part of that land. So I don't want to, you know, imply that none of this land is being preserved as what it was before when the Grail did sell it to the, the park system. Um, I do think, though, that in my opinion, that, I mean, while I, I appreciate Dries' attempt to do the best they could at preserving some of the integrity of the land. I think there could have been, uh, there could be some better efforts towards that. Um, I think what I'm hearing from the community is there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of history of the Grail that, that, that you know, to, to put houses there uh, and not think through it a little bit more on how we can preserve some of the history, some of the heritage um, of the Grail, I think is important. 
I know there's some there's some language in here about that. Uh, it's, it's kind of, and I know this is the beginning, but it's not very specific. Uh, I think there could be some some better efforts at changing the density and looking at that. I don't know whether we need to go down as far as the what is it what medium? What it's coming as? Um, no, 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 no. Whether we need to go down that far? I don't know. I don't. That's <laughs> Say we have to do that, but I think um, removing some of the density and replacing it with some some other elements that maybe show the history. But you know, and again, I don't I'm not the person to plan for that, but uh, more of the history of the Grail and, and more of what they're what they were about. So when people do, if you know, if this does go through and, and it gets through, I, it's this is a long process, guys. This is not something that happens overnight. Trust me, we've got sewers and everything else to get through. If it's going to go through, but I think it's necessary to to show some of the people who live in the neighborhood they would know what the grail was, it wouldn't be just lost and, and blown away with a bunch of houses. And, and then somebody said, oh, the grail used to be here, and nobody knows about it. So um, now with that, all that said, I mean, if, uh, and I appreciate that the reason I wanted the person to speak, and I, I apologize, I forget your name, it wasn't written down, is I like to hear both sides. You know, it's this is this is very one-sided, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just saying we've got to hear both sides and understand both sides so we can make an educated decision out here for what we're going to do. Um, so I think, in my opinion, I think that there needs to be a better effort towards making a little bit more uh, in, in understanding what that some of those areas are going to be and, and remove some of the density so we can have a little bit more control over what this land is going to be um, and preserve it for what it once was. Uh, again, you know, there's a park next to it. They bought that. I appreciate that. I mean, we would all love for everything to be a park and, and, and um, other uses, but the, the landowners can sell it for what they want and we have to adapt it and try to figure out how we can you know, utilize that uh, to the best of our ability. So uh, we got to make a decision here. I think we do have to make a decision. I, don't, I really don't want to table this um, tonight, or not table it, but move it forward. I don't, I don't know if that's going to gain anything or not. Um, really, the opinions right now, it's up to you. But, yes, Ms. Kressler. I, I have one thing. Um, I think the grass should be given great credit. They have 300 acres. They're only selling money. And they need that money for their some of their other things and some pensions and things. For them to, to put 100 acres into a city park and then maintain the other parcel and only sell a third of it, I think it's really no worries. They could have easily have sold the park land too. You know, if you're a corporation, you would have sold half of it and then used that as a tax write-off. Yeah, the park on the other. Yeah, that's that's done all the time. They didn't have to do that. They also could have shown it to the media. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm just saying is, uh, I mean, there's been a few comments against the membership and the board, which I don't think is fair. Which has nothing to do with us. <laughs> well, with that being said, I would like to make a motion uh, not to recommend the initiation of the SPD. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Mr. Gressler? No. Three zero. Motion carries. 